So we've got a poor little JP8080 on the bench. Uh, this is one of Roland's analog modeling uh, synthesizers. So it's basically just going to be a big confuser in there. Um, apparently it got knocked um, onto the floor or something like that and stopped working. So not sure what we can do. We'll have a look. Hopefully it's just a cable might have got unlodged. Or the worst case scenario, a PCB might be cracked or something. So, um, to get her apart, looks convoluted. I can even see just big fat DSP chips f through the hole there. Um, yeah. I guess we'll just start, start taking out some screws and see what happens. Okay, it looks like we've got a little bit of movement there. Um, nicely reassuringly metal base on these, actually, the construction. It's really good. Okay. So yes, as suspected, lots of digitalness. Um, I've just looked for any signs of anything. I really can't see any signs of damage anywhere. Um, I want to have a look inside the power supply, which means taking this protective um case off we have a ribbon cable here which comes from the memory card We have the power supply. I can't see anything particularly, there's no cracks or anything like that. There's a fuse here. Okay. Okay. This fuse is gone. Let's just raise the stakes somewhat. T2 amp. That's what it's supposed to be. That's good. At least it's not. Didn't have a massive fuse in there. Time delay. 2 amp. At some point they've got mixed in with my 1.6 amps. Okay, I've got one. Well, let's see what happens. Um, it obviously blew for a reason. I don't know if you can see. There's a blue dot on this transformer and a blue dot on this cap. Which kind of makes me think this has been looked at before. Anyway, I'm going to have to actually screw this power supply back into its cage because it lifts it from the, uh, the bottom. So it won't be touching. Okay, I've put that back in there. I guess we'll give it a go. Um, there's the fuse, we can see that there. I'm going to use an earth trip switch. Just in case. Okay, she switched off. Watch this space. Okay, she's blowing the fuse again. You have to take your hat off to these Japanese designers. Beautiful little power supply here. Quite a simple uh, mains comes in here. 
a bit of filtering. Um, this is the main switching transistor with a transformer here feeding the output regulators. And that looks like a shop key diode or something. So, yeah, and it turns out I did do a quick check of these transistors to see if they were short, but this main switching transistor. is uh, totally short so we're going to whip that out um, and whilst I'm there might as well just check this cap can't tell if that's bulging um, let's quickly measure that Well, that says in circuit leaky, so I might just whip that out as well. There's a bridge rectifier here. Let's just check that. No real apparent shorts there, so. Um, why don't I just quickly whiz through these? I don't think it's going to be on the output stage. Is this switching regulator? So let's just concentrate on those first. Okay, here's a transistor. Yeah, that's short every which way possible. And if we check out this capacitor, which is supposed to be, well, it's a nice Nichicon, 68 microfarad. Yep, 65.3.56 uh, resi internal resistance. So that is a, still a great cap. It was just measuring leaky in circuit. So, so I wonder if it's possible for me to work out what the voltage rails are coming off this power supply um, and see if we can boot up the JP off the bench power supply. That way we can see how much current it's drawing and then find out if anything on the main board has made this blow. I was just moving this around. And I could have sworn I heard something rattling. It's not doing it now. I think to be on the safe side, before I can try and power anything up, I'm gonna to have to make sure there's nothing loose floating around in there. I wasn't going crazy. There's a screw in here. And I bet that's conductive. It's definitely worth checking. Making sure. That, oh, I'm so pleased I took this out now. Um, everything else looks kind of fine. I can't really even see where it's come from. So, I guess I'll just put it back together. So this is the screw that we found inside. I've got my probes connected to the continuity tester. So 
So indeed, that floating around inside the front panel can short things out. So luckily we have the JP8080 service manual. And here on page 13, we can see that our little uh, power supply, and that's generating a plus 5 volts and a plus and minus 15 volts to the board. This looks a bit like a VCA chip to me. It's a Mitsubishi M5241. Indeed, it is a dual VCA volume control. I suspect they're using this as the main left and right output volume. And indeed, here it is in page 20 of the service manual. This is our dual VCA running off the plus 15, minus 15, and an analog ground by the looks of it. This is the main uh, ribbon connector where the power comes in. I'm just going to stick a probe on the first pin. Hopefully it will stay on there. So we know that pin 10 is the positive supply, which is this pin here. Okay, that's great. I'm betting that the next pin along will be the earth, which is pin three. Just one, two, three. It's okay, so far so good. And the negative supply, I'm betting, will be the next one. Which is pin four. So pin one, two, three, four. Great. Okay, if we go to the next pin. This pin here is a 74H074 and this should be, it's plus 5 volts. Okay, that's good. So we seem to have uh, three more pins to buzz out. Oh, the next one I think is a 5 volt. Yeah, those two pins are five volts. That's not uncommon. And so this has to be the ground. Which it is. And then I reckon this is also ground. Okay, so we know enough now how to connect this up to the bench power supplies. And as a last sanity check, we can just see here that indeed those two pins are uh, on the same copper plane. If I can just get the camera still. These two are the plus 5 volts and these two are the plus 5 volts ground. One last test that we should do before we actually connect any power to this thing is we're just going to measure the resistance between the voltage rails and ground. So this is our plus 15 volts and this is our ground. There's obviously a cap involved somewhere, but we're on the killer home range, so that's okay. Let's try the negative voltage rail. Similar sort of thing, we can see the resistance changing, obviously a cap settling at 4K, so I'm not too concerned about the plus and minus voltage rails. Let's move to the digital ground. And we're still in the killer homes for digital ground. And we we'll tried the positive rail again. Still in the killer homes. 
So that's okay, let's have a look at the 5 volt rail. Hmm. 444 ohms. That seems quite low to me. Not unheard of. And there's, there is a lot of DSP on here, as well as the old confuser itself. Um, well, we can power up and we can current limit the 5 volt rail um, and see what happens. I'm going to use my trusty D32T bench power supplies to run this test. Um, this machine here is going to run the plus and minus 15 volts. And this is going to run the 5 volts. I'm going to current limit at 600 milliamps on the 5 volt range. And I don't suspect the analog circuit will draw too much. So I'm going to current limit it at th around 300 milliamps. I've brought all the power from the power supplies to this little breadboard. And I've joined all the earths together. So now we have... A 15 volt rail, a minus 15 volt rail, and a 5 volt rail. I'll probably leave the multimeter connected to the 5 volt rail so I can see if there's any drop as we turn it on. So this is the plus 15 volts. That's going there. This is the analog ground for the analog circuitry. That will be grounded with the rest. Negative 12 volts. And then we have the plus five and the ground for the plus five voltage row. So the ground joins all the other grounds and that goes into the plus five volts row. I'm just going to turn my Keefley multimeter on and measure the five volts there. Okay, it's a bit tricky to film this on my own. Um, when I turn this power supply on, it will turn on the plus and minus rails. And um, this one is telling us it's set to 600 milliamps. As soon as I turn it on, it will switch to the actual current door. Okay, let's see what happens. It's pulling just over 400. And it's actually 4.8 vo volts now. So this is really difficult to do on, on my own. So it looks like we have no real computer action. These four lights are on. The analog circuitry looks about right. 115 milliamps on the positive rail. 89 milliamps. 422 milliamps. I did have to turn the current limit up. I don't know if you noticed it was flashing. That means it's just as hitting that current limit. Seems a little bit too high still, maybe. Um, although that falls well within the two amp fuse. Um, okay, I think what we should do is look to see how those four lights are switched on. So we know that there is a loose screw inside between the front panel and the case. Um, and when we switch on, we see four LEDs light up, which uh, are these ones here. Mode up, mode down, mode random, and mode RPS. So all these lights are lit up, and they're controlled 
via this transistor and they go to this edge connector here by the looks of it and if we zoom out this is an overview of the whole front panel here we have all the potentiometers they in groups of eight multiplex through this switch uh, these lines here control are being controlled by the micro confuser um, and there's four of those um, the network of buttons connect via this chip uh, TC74HC138P um, and this same chip is the one that drives these transistors as well so it looks like almost certainly that screw must have shorted something out on the board here uh, the best case scenario is it could be a uh, I doubt whether it will just be a transistor. Now with this synthesizer there is certain functions that you can get to. Um, if you hold down a couple of buttons on the front panel then turn it on it takes you into special service modes and if any if this chip was say shorted out and broken uh, it might think that there's buttons being pressed when there's not. Oh here you can see we have a 5 volt coming from here and they call that A5 volts we have a plus and minus 15 comes from the main board as well oh and here's a D5 volts so they're, they're running two different 5 volt rails along here coming from the same 5 volt on the power supply and A5 volts seems to be for all the potentiometers and D5 volts all a lot for the uh, light switching so that's really interesting they um, they're really keeping the 5 volt controlling all the potentiometers away from everything else and each potentiometer comes through uh, a low pass filter before it hits the multiplexer and then we come out of the multiplexer through another low pass filter and that's buffered out back to the micro this is the ribbon cable that's feeding the power to the front panel and as soon as we take that off we get a much more sensible reading that's in the kilo ohm range now I'll put that back in now I've marked this to make it easy for me to do this on the camera and if we measure that's the A voltage well A5 volts that's measuring 400 ohms 500 ohms and these ones here That's the D volt, 5 volts well. That's measuring 6.2 mega ohms. So it almost looks like it's the A voltage rail that is dragging it down. Now all I can remember seeing on there are those um, 4051 switches, the multiplexers. But we have to consider there's uh, potentiometers, 27 of them. Um, strapped across this A5 volt rail uh, these potentiometers are 20k each so as a sanity check we have 27 resistors all at 20k that gives us 740 ohms but there's other sliders on there as well so you can easily see that resistance going down to 500 ohms with those extra sliders. So considering the nature of what we're dealing with here, I think I'm going to uh, take the front panel out and just have a snoop around. Well, that was...
was actually pretty uneventful. There was nothing wrong on that front panel. I took out all the ICs. I checked them on my IC checker. Um, all the buttons were working correctly. All the LEDs were fine. Um, There's absolutely nothing wrong on there that I could find. So I started to turn my attention to these electrolytic caps. Um, and I come across this one, which was measuring a high ESR. And if you can see, it's got a red dot on there. And the solder joints are definitely not from factory. So someone has had this cap out before. Well, that's interesting. C336 is part of this chip here, which is sending a reset line back to the micro. So this, I think, is a timing cap. But in here, it's saying it's 10 microfarad, not 3.3 microfarad. So the plot thickens. So I think we've just stumbled on a little rabbit hole here. Um, this was the 3 microfarad, sorry, 3.3 .3 microfarad out of circuit. Yeah, 40 ohms. And I just happened to stumble upon this one. Uh, this meter, to some extent, can measure the caps in circuit. And this one had failed. Um, Forty ohms, very high. So none of these caps I can be trusted. I think I'm the only chance I've got to even try and repair it is to check all the caps. Well, that was a worthwhile endeavour. I found four completely out of whack capacitors here. Um, so I'm going to order a new set. And at least that will give us a better starting point. At least a couple of these are to do with the um, delaying of the reset line for the micro. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> 